Now, I did actually have quite a long, well-prepared presentation, which I'm not going to use for a number of reasons. Um, and I don't know how it is for you when you are trying to write something or make a presentation and uh, you can't quite find the right words. In a sense, of course, we're here to celebrate what's been great. Against that, I feel very sad. And that's not a kind of litoist um, for a great time gone. Um, it's a whole combination of things, and, and I, that's with me right now. Um, so what I'm going to do is very simply answer the questions I was asked uh, by Christoph, and uh, say, say a few things that I know, and then maybe this will lead into some conversation. So, can we have another picture, please? I like to show this slide at the beginning of any presentation. I'd like you all to um, put your hand up if you know if any of them people are. Okay, can you put your hand up if you know more than one person? Three people? Four, okay. So on your left, you've got John Lennon, a son of Liverpool, uh, obviously famous for being in the Beatles. His partner, the woman that stole him, supposedly, from Liverpool, Yoko Ono, who was a member of Fluxus. Next to him, in a way, as much as a hero as I've got, Nam June Pike, who was uh, effectively the founder of media art. And um, he's next to Abe Shibuya, who's the technical director of Sony Lab in Tokyo. This picture's taken around 1984. Now, Nam June Pike, who featured in a retrospective between uh, Kunstpalast Düsseldorf, Fact and Tate Liverpool, um, invented a term called the information superhighway in about 1984. And he kind of foresaw that we might be living in this globalized condition. And he started a series of works which used distributed performance um, long before the internet existed, um, piecing together bits of connectivity that he could find. And I think that's very interesting from my own perspective, being interested in media art and the internet, of course. Um, so that's the first question. Now, I'm not, someone might have already done this in the first session, but who uh, voted Brexit? You could come and own up. All right, okay. Who knows someone who voted Brexit? That's good. All right. Um, because for a, for a while, I suspect that a lot of us didn't, weren't really connecting, and I, it, that kind of concurs with some of the comments that Ruth made. Um, anyone here from Hull? Excellent, we must talk. Of course, now I've, that's where you are, yeah, right. Okay, so about a year ago, there was a referendum, and uh, as a, as a uh, keen tennis player, um, I went to Wimbledon for the first time, and it was the day after the referendum, and I got in a taxi, and I went to Wimbledon, watched some fantastic tennis, uh, it was great, and it was a very strange day because I was basically with people on kind of corporate meal tickets. Um, had a great time, though. It was fantastic. I'd recommend it. Um, and then I went, the following evening, I went up to Hull. Yeah? And I went to visit a lot of my friends who voted Brexit. And I got there, and it was absolutely pissing down. The, the whole city was in a state of devastation as they tried to rebuild the pavement in advance of the UK city of culture. Um, and it just felt like, it felt like death. Yeah? And it is worlds apart. Less worlds apart than it was because they're doing really well with the UK city of culture. So some of this is a narrative about the North and the South. And of course there are fine grains of poor and rich, privileged and unprivileged in any one place. It's too easy to generalize. But what we're learning in Hull is that, like Liverpool, it's beginning to gain a sense of self-esteem. So having voted itself the UK's crappiest city, where, which I heard on a radio show in a car park in a national park in Australia, where I lived at the time, and I couldn't believe it, um, that Liverpool now actually believes it is a centre for arts and culture. It's important. Um, and Hull is definitely being fast-tracked 
on an education around integration and uh, learning about other people, because it can be extremely isolated and inward looking, and that's having lived there for 12 odd years and worked there more recently. Now Liverpool, uh, we're supposed to talk about the um, Creative Europe project, but Liverpool actually did very well out of the Objective One scheme. So it got significant structural funds, unlike many other places in the UK. Um, it led to the formation of a fantastic centre. Is Eddie still here? Is he hiding? Eddie? Okay, he's hiding behind the pillar. But Eddie was the founding director of FACT. And uh, at that time, it was based around a video festival that I was in, because I'm basically a practitioner, I'm an artist, um, and also a collaboration program. Um, but it was a very significant thing for the city, and it then led on to a new confidence in arts and culture as a, a factor in regeneration, which then perhaps led to the formation of Liverpool Biennale, and perhaps the successful European Capital of Culture, which we will celebrate uh, next year in 2018, because it's been monstrously successful. Um, so, from that, though, with its, in a sense, with a lot of its roots in working class culture, working with people, um, we now sort of do pride ourselves in the way that the whole program actually integrates by a few examples I've got written here. People working in the criminal justice system, returning soldiers, people who are mentally ill, including me, because we all are, as part of the consumer society. Um, young people from all, all sorts of different backgrounds. And hopefully not just lip service, and of course recognizing that half the time we're pissing in the ocean. But it's a national center, and it's in Liverpool, not London, and that's important. Okay. So, in a sense, we got thrown a, a, a bit of a lifeline with the capital of culture. Uh, you know, if that hadn't happened, who knows where it would be as a city. Um, it, but it has made a terrific difference. But I'd like to just talk about my, my own path in relationship to the European program. Um, 1992, uh, John Major hosted the European Union, and he chucked out a load of money, very five months' notice, and myself and a few colleagues set up something called the Root Festival. Um, and actually this year we just revisited it as part of the UK City of Culture in Hull, rerouted. Um, so start thinking about European boundaries and who was in and who wasn't. Uh, then we got lucky. I met my mate Peter Zorn from Verkleitz Gesellschaft in the former East. And we set up a network called the European Media Art Residency Exchange. Now this is before the Creative Europe program or its predecessor. And we managed to set up a residency exchange using ISDN, uh, kind of pre-internet and also using Avid when it was a very kind of new tool for non-linear non editing. It was great. We had partners, V2, Transmediali, Bandit Image, so on and so forth. Fantastic thing. Then through the program before Creative Europe, funded something called Media Facades, and we met a load of new people, network of about eight organizations across Europe. Brilliant, looking at technologies, architecture, urban space, democracy, and it then led to another funded project called Connecting Cities. Um, with most of those partners and some new, um, Sousa Pop is to be named because she was the initiator of that project. Lasted for six years, fantastic, yeah? And it still continues, even though we, we are unsuccessful in our Creative Europe application. Um, and there's about 22 members to this platform uh, many of which are outside of Europe. Unique, who are represented here today, they've done, a, they're worth a nod, thank you. Um, so what are the gains of the curative program and, and what do I think were some of the general principles? To speak with strangers. So like Eddie, I still get the number 80 bus um, and I'll have a chat with people on the bus and, um, of course, when you're in a strange place or amongst new people, there's an element of risk to bother to talk with them. Um, and I'm very lucky that I've worked with an eminent artist called Christoph 
Wodyszko, who's Polish and lives in New York and was a Warsaw Ghetto survivor. And he talks strongly about learning when to speak out. And he's also dedicated his life to working around issues of mobility and also using prosthetic devices to engender a set of relationships between people that don't know each other. So, in a sense, I think that's a pretty high principle to work for. Um, and that's about making friends. It's about the continuity to keep seeing people. Um, and it's about building knowledge. Um, and it's about new experience. Um, now, just to jump back a little bit. Now, I was, you know, I was lucky. I was, I was the secondary school kid who didn't get O-levels um, and just got into art college and then became not a bad filmmaker. And I got invited to a number of film festivals. And this was the first time I'd ever been abroad because my family didn't go on foreign holidays because they didn't want to or they couldn't afford to. I don't know. Um, but I then I got in the habit of going around a bit and being invited places. And I know British Council here, thank you, because you pay for some of those trips. Um, then as a curator, you get used to kind of working across places. Um, so I think that there's a massive kind of privilege in being able to afford to be sociable and have the time to be able to talk to people um, and sit down and have a drink and some food. And that gives you a new set of experiences that you hear from other people. And I guess there's something about here of affordance. I love the word affordance. Is that when can you afford mobility as opposed to being forced to migrate? Um, it gave us an enormous opportunity to discover new artists, new curators, um, and do swapsies. And now, of course, as we see some loss, there is real loss, and this is part of my sadness, um, that I'm going to lose new talent, no question about it. Um, I'm not going to be able to afford, me and my colleagues are not going to be able to afford to do as much research. Um, already, in terms of trying to get visas for artists coming into the UK, it's getting increasingly difficult. Um, and that's, problem. that's a problem, because it means we will become more and more um, hermetic and monocultural, perhaps. Um, staffing. Like, I'm very lucky that I've got staff from Latvia and Sp uh, Spain, at uh, fact. And they're brilliant. And they came specially to Liverpool to work with us. Um, and they're now just thinking, actually, is this, is this going to be OK going forward? And actually, I don't think I agree with your principles, because we still believe in Europe. Um, cash, you know. It's tough. So actually having money for artists to be able to travel and make new commissions um, through some of these schemes was brilliant. It was fantastic, and it meant that we could work with people from different countries, and they could travel, and we could uh, go, and, go and see other people's commissions. Fantastic. And then, again, trying to stay high level around values. And it, a lot of this just sounds like a cliche, I guess, but something around intercultural dialogue, whatever that means. But um, multiculturalism, not that multicultural. It was largely, it was northern, nor, mostly northern European. Like, there was always, you're always trying to find a South European or a, a Balkan country to be part of your bid, because if you didn't have that, you couldn't show uh, diversity. But also, within the the degrees of privilege that existed in these projects, predominantly white. Um, tolerance, you know, as I get older, that, that becomes a little bit easier. Skills, the skills of actually communicating and articulating ideas um, between languages, which, of course, the British are rubbish at. Um, and then this concept, and I miss Julie Bicycle's talk, but I'd love to speak with you, but um, international citizenship. I think that's still a belief that I think is essential that we should uphold. Um, and especially in relationship to, the, to climate change and migration of things which will only accelerate so quickly uh, and as a, as a new subject for fact. So now what? Uh, how to stay positive? You know, it's my job as the leader of an organization to um, not burst into tears every moment, um, have a plan, yeah, I'm very happy that my organization was successful in its 
Arts Council bid, and we've got four years core funding. That's great. Um, so how to stay positive? So how, there must be something in here around internationalism, surely. And what are all those values that I've just spoken about, the things that can be imported into new agendas? So I'm very lucky that, in a sense, through being privileged enough to get that far, I've now got a set of relationships in Shenzhen, in China, um, across Indonesia, in Taiwan, in South Korea, uh, Panama City as part of Latin American Capital of Culture, 2019. Um, you know, it's, it's become easier to, to speak internationally and work with people. That shouldn't be underestimated. Um, similarly, we are also, and this is a plug, but we run the Collide program with CERN in Geneva, Switzerland, which is a significant art science residency. Um, and also with a network called Scanner with CCB in Barcelona, Le Lu Unique in Nantes, and uh, CERN itself. The continuation of the European Media Art Residency Exchange. How about another slide? Um, Imare, uh, okay. Um, so the, we didn't get our... We didn't get a bid for that either, but we're still doing it because we still believe it's worth continuing. And actually, since 1994, we've hosted over 250 artists' residents, um, largely kind of new emerging artists, many of which have gone on to do great things. And even if we haven't got any money, we will revert to couch surfing like we used to when we didn't have any money. I, that, that you know, people, you know, with small amounts of money, you can still do something. Um, yeah, so how do you continue the friendships? I was, you know, as, as I was putting this together, I was thinking, oh, I actually haven't spoken to Caesar for six months. Now, that wouldn't have been the case when the projects were live. Yeah, and then I um, actually have to recollect who the partners were in previous projects. And for all of you who are programmers, curators, etc., you know that you're already living two years into the future as you make your program, and you've probably forgotten what you did last year. That's, that's certainly what my brain's like. Um, and as we let go of friends as they die or become less visible from a, a panorama, that, of course, that's essential in making new friends. That's going from one school to another as a kid. Um, but there are certain people that you really do want to uh, retain as friends for a lifetime. And I hope that I've got some of those, despite the absence of this um, fiscal subvention. Um, and there's Skype. And there's VR. And, uh, you know, certainly the, techn the technologies will make a lot of virtual travel a lot easier especially is that we should all stop flying, probably, if we're going to take this climate change uh, debate seriously. You know, so changes in behavior start with yourself. And I, I've, been, I've used up so much gas on air, air, air flights. Um, can I change that? How do I go um, more carbon neutral? Um, but of course, I, I, what I really miss is getting pissed eating food I've not had before, cooking in someone's kitchen, having an argument in a language I don't understand, dreaming, reflecting with time and space. Staying positive. Uh, now, of course, a lot of this stuff, you know, great, I'm the privileged, you too, probably. Um, but what can we take, take from that and use here? So... You can repay the lessons of hospitality. Yeah, so that in terms of the hospitality that I was shown, um, clearly that people who maybe have had less choice as to uh, where they've moved to and from, you know, just remembering a train journey uh, coming out of Linz going to Munich, and it was the first, got on the train, I got train tickets with my colleague, and the trains were full of people. And I, Hang on a minute, that's my seat. What are you doing in my seat? Yeah, and then realizing actually that the person in my seat was someone who'd just been let out of a holding camp in Budapest, and it was the first train that had been allowed to leave Hungary to go to Munich with a, a bunch of guys from Syria who were exhausted, and it was a very humbling experience. 
Um, but of course, I now live in a community, you know, I'm pretty sure we all do, um, where there are people who've got bugger all. Yeah, they're trying to scrape half a farthing together. So I'll stop there. <laughs>